Welcome back to my channel. And here we go with another episode of scary shit to read to you. Forever. A drug. Want to get high tonight? Scott was bordering on junkie status, and I was always weary about spending time with him, normally in the filthy apartment of some dealer friend while he shot up. It seemed like he was bordering on a collapse, and I was scared of doing the same. Uh, I, I don't know, what are you thinking? On the other hand, I had been despondent since breaking up with Ruth. Maybe something to take my mind off the pain would help. I knew she was better off without me, I was just holding her back. Meet me at Jared's. He said he wants me to try something new. This made me feel a little better. Jared was probably the nicest dealer Scott knew, and his stuff was generally sourced well. Plus, his apartment was at least somewhat clean. You know I don't fuck with needles. Yeah, man, it's fine. Nothing like that. I showed up at 8 with three beers in my system that had failed to calm the nervous energy I was feeling. Whatever. It's fine. It's, it's going to be fine. Jared was happy to see me and poured me a whiskey. I felt a little weird and sat down at the table. He put three black pills down in front of us. I got this from a trusted contact overseas. He began said it's like nothing else. He smiled. Thought the three of us could test drive it before I put in an order, see if it's really worth it. Stuff is called forever. Scott laughed and downed a pill. Jared and I followed suit. I sat down and stared at the TV waiting for it to kick in. It was fine. I felt really mellow, sort of like the room and me with it. it was stretching in a weird way. We all wound up falling asleep. I woke up the next day feeling fine and we parted ways. No big deal. Certainly nothing life-changing. Years passed. I never left town. Never really did anything. Could never kick smoking cigarettes either. Wasn't a surprise when the doc told me the blood I was coughing up was cancer. Shit. Too late to do anything. I was alone when I took my last breath. I woke up back in Jared's apartment, sun streaming through the window. What the fuck? I hallucinated an entire sad life? What, what was that drug? I mumbled something at Jared and Scott and walked outside. What a weird dream. I decided I could do more. Maybe that was a wake-up call. Applied to a job I didn't think I was qualified for and got it. Stopped screwing around, quit smoking, married a nice girl, had a kid who loved to play ball outside. He didn't even see the truck coming the day he chased his ball into the street. But I did. Probably never moved that fast in my life. Fast enough to push him out of the way, but not fast enough to get myself out of the way. Oh well, what a way to go. Protecting someone you love. I woke up in Jared's apartment. Fuck me! What the hell was happening? I had to short circuit this. I, I must still be tripping. I decided to throw myself off the bridge down the street. When I got there, I found I physically couldn't do it. Something stopped me. So killing myself was out. I had to go home and figure this out. I wasn't paying attention as I walked upstairs to my apartment. If I had, I would have noticed the neighbor's kid had left a toy car on one of them. When I slipped and tumbled, I knew it was going to be bad. I woke up in Jared's apartment. Maybe this could be fun. However long this lasts, I can do anything and it's not real. Like lucid dreaming, but it lasts for decades. I tried a life of crime. Got shot coming out of an electronics store. Not cut out for that, and it hurt like hell. Screwed around, partied too much, overdosed. Back to Jared's when it all goes to hell. I had lived 10 or 12 lifetimes when I saw her, Ruth. It might seem weird to have forgotten her, but you have to remember we had broken up probably 300 years before. She was older, divorced, sad. 
She married the wrong guy after our breakup and got abused for years. I was so depressed after our talk, I just walked for hours thinking about how sad her life had turned out. I thought I was helping her. Found myself in a rough neighborhood when I got jumped, I didn't hand over my wallet. That was a mistake. And I woke up in Jared's apartment. This time I could fix it. I bought a bunch of flowers and went to Ruth's. She took me back. We got married, had a family, we traveled the world. Best friends. It was incredible. The best life I ever had. I died a happy old man surrounded by family. I woke up in Jared's apartment. I bought a bunch of flowers and went to Ruth. If I'm stuck in this Groundhog Day shit, I know what to do. You know what isn't boring? Living the best goddamn life you can twice, three times, ten times. The rough edges get smoothed away. You learn when bad news is coming, when you need to sidestep a bad argument, just absolute happiness. If you get to choose happiness, you choose it every damn time. Then one day we were in Paris celebrating our 30th anniversary. I'd taken this trip with her 20 times. She walked down to the cafe to give me some breakfast. A car jumped the sidewalk and killed her. That had never happened before. The next lifetime was worse. We made it 12 years after our wedding before she got some weird flu variant and died. The next one she was diagnosed with cancer a year after marriage. We never had kids. The next one her building had burned down the night I spent at Jared's. I stood outside with flowers in my hands staring at the smoking ruins. A filthy old homeless man walked up next to me as I stared in disbelief. Thought you could cheat it, did you? He said. Thought he wouldn't notice, but he did. <laughs> he started laughing as he walked away. But he did. <laughs> I watched him as he walked away. He turned back from time to time to smile at me. My lives turned dark. Friends were killed in horrible accidents. Serial killers struck peaceful towns and ravaged the families of those I loved. Overdose, disease, murder, death, everything was wrong. The world turned too. Dictators came to power, wars broke out, hatred rose, cities burned, countries shattered, the world bled. The old man would appear from time to time though centuries would sometimes pass between sightings. He always laughed at me, told me that he had me now, always smiled at me. I drifted from one dying port town to the next, finding work where I could, drinking away shitty lifetime after shitty lifetime. I was sitting in a bar in the capital of East Scotland, watching some cable news about a genocide in some country that hadn't even existed in most of my lifetimes. The bartender laughed and I looked at him clearly for the first time. It was the old man. He smiled at me. Who the fuck are you? I growled. I've seen him longer than you. He sees you now. <laughs> Where do I go to find him? He laughed. <laughs> Go to Samar in the Philippines. Not now. In your next life. When you are still young. Find Birigan. He waits for you there. <laughs> he smiled at me. And I stumbled for the door. I lived another dozen years before a boat I was on went down in a storm. I woke up in Jared's apartment. This time, I immediately started looking for a way to get to the Philippines. I sold my car and walked to work for six months, eating the cheapest food I could find. I arrived confused. Turns out Berrigan isn't a real place, or maybe it is. I found work under the table, making money however I could. I asked about the invisible city of local folklore. I asked questions about the lore behind it. I learned how many people who have seen it are victims of demonic possession. I searched for it, but every chance I got, years passed by. I lived an invisible life, 
Like the invisible city I sought. The world rotted away, but I still searched. One night, I was walking home and a car stopped next to me. I heard a familiar laugh through the window. I looked in and saw the old man. He smiled at me and I got in the car. We drove for hours. The gas gauge never moved. Finally, in the distance, I saw a gleaming city of light. He pulled over and gestured. You have to walk from here. He is waiting for you in the center of the city. He smiled. I got out and walked. Felt like I walked for days, but the sun never came up, and I never grew thirsty. I walked into a gleaming, deserted city. I felt drawn to a giant tower in the center of the city. It glowed with a light, despite having no windows or obvious source of illumination. I was not surprised to find a single door at the bottom of the tower. I entered and began to climb. As I went, I heard a voice, deep and old. I couldn't make out the words. I climbed forever, finally reaching a door. I opened it and stepped inside, facing a giant black abyss. The voice was everywhere now. Every word ripped me apart. I watched you cheat me. Did you think you could live your lies forever? I screamed. You're with me now. Forever. I destroyed this world. The abyss closed and I realized I was staring at a giant mouth. It opened again. I thought of Ruth. The world went black. I woke up in the hospital. Scott jumped up from the chair in the corner. Oh, dude, I'm so glad you're awake. Uh, what happened? He looked over his shoulder. We were just about to take those pills and you threw up all over them and then collapsed. You had a crazy fever. I looked around. How long have I been out? Four days. Ruth keeps chasing me out of here, thinks I did this. He glanced at his shoes. Nurses don't like me much either. Why is Ruth here? She's your emergency contact, dude. Hasn't left your side even to go home and sleep. She's just getting coffee now. He paused and shifted awkwardly. Do you have any cash? Jared is kind of pissed you puked on his stuff. I heard an excited shriek and barely managed to turn my head as Ruth launched herself at me. I was in the hospital for another four days before getting discharged. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, said it must have just been a freak infection. Getting discharged was great. Ruth picking me up and bringing me to Scott's so I could go home with him was the first NA meeting. Seeing me almost die scared him and he was trying to straighten himself out. Then Ruth and I had a special date planned. Things were getting figured out. We were thrilled for another chance. I walked out to the curb and waited for Ruth to pull her car around. I stood there in the sunlight, feeling alive for the first time in, I guess, a millennia. A nurse rolled another patient in the wheelchair out to the curb, locked his wheels and walked outside. I felt the breeze on my face and smiled. The old man in the wheelchair laughed. I stared at him and he winked. He let you go. <laughs> Make sure he doesn't get his teeth into you again. <laughs> then he smiled at me. This time, I smiled back. That was forever a drug. Um, I dug that. That was a cool, like, the dudes live essentially thousands of years and he's lived lifetime after lifetime of just seeing the worst in humanity seeing the worst in himself the best in himself and really like the only payoff came at the very end when the abyss was like hey i'm gonna fucking eat you i'm going to eat your soul and essentially like sucked him in and he he teleported to i guess like the old man said he let him go so he may have seen some potential in him and was like, hey, you know what? We'll give you, we'll give you a 1,001 chance and we'll see how you do this time, pal. 
That was really cool. That was short and sweet and uh, it was impactful. I haven't read a story where it's like, there's so much just dread and despair in it, but it ends on such a nice, like light, happy note. I dug that, that was awesome. So if you guys like that, like button, subscribe button, comment, leave a comment right now. If you don't, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna grab a knife and I'm gonna cut a vegetable that looks like a Schweiner and it'll be yours because like 85% of you guys are men. So you'll know exactly what I mean by that. So leave me a comment. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Do all the things that I want you to do because I said, Bye.